Well, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here. I'm gonna get straight into the action on this one. Brand new and exciting, blah, 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 it, I, honor and a service, let's do it. We're gonna be looking at graphing absolute value functions. We've done it before, a little more lecture based. I'm gonna add some features within this one though. This is a worksheet and practice problems and if you'd like to see this PDF, uh, I'll give you uh, an attachment down below and kind of give you the idea of the different things we talk about. Because we're not always graphing them, sometimes we're just writing out features, sometimes we're given the graph and we got to write the equation. There's a little word problem thing at the end, so I'll show you that context as well. And uh, I just, you know, I want to go over some of the terms. I am going to be talking about axis of symmetry. This sheet does not talk about it, it's not my own sheet. It doesn't talk about axis of symmetry, so I'll provide that. And I'll use some other terms instead of this every so often. But the visual appearance will be nice for you. All right, so with this one here, for you to understand how all these things work, I wanted to leave some room at top and say that, hey, our general vertex form occur, uh, appears like this. If you haven't watched my other video, I do ask that you do on graphing absolute value functions. This is just another set of practice problems where we're doing, uh, I mean, we're doing a little bit more than it. We're analyzing them and doing things like that. Uh, A represents your stretch factor. This represents your stretch factor and then your vertex occurs at the point h comma k. So again, this is more, this is less of me teaching unless it's something you didn't hear from the last one. And it's more of me doing these problems. I wanna you know, kind of get through them. Anyway, there's a apparent function that is when you have your a value be one, your h value be zero, and your k value be zero. It reads as y equals the absolute value of x. Basically what happens is your vertex is at the origin and you have a stretch factor of one, which means it's just a basic slope of rise and run one. And that's where we can compare these narrow or wider same things. So when you have a parent function that does this up one over one kind of thing like that, you know, if a graph is taller, if a graph is taller, if it has a larger slope, if you will, a higher stretch factor, it's technically narrower. And then if it has a, uh, you know, like up one over two kind of thing like this, uh, and it's more vertically compressed and it's technically wider. So this is gonna be an example of wider and taller. And they won't always be graphed, but we're looking for A values that are more than one when they're taller and A values that are between zero and one, fractions if you will, if they're wider. Just as a, not all fractions, between zero and one, between zero and one. Just as a heads up, if it's flipped upside down, then it's, the larger negative numbers are taller. The smaller negative numbers can be wider. Okay, like that. Or uh, narrow, sorry, it says taller. Uh, narrower, narrower. See, I'm already saying taller um, there. Okay, here we go. Uh, so numbers one through six here, we are going to do the following. We're going to identify the vertex, the location, determine if the graph opens up or down, all these things. We're gonna answer all these questions here and I'll kind of make mention of how you can know what these are based on the information. All right, on number one here, I have y equals negative absolute value of x plus one. So if you were gonna fill out more information, you could call this a negative one right here, and you could call this a plus zero right here. You could even call this in here x minus negative one because we know that's an x minus h. What we have to do for the vertex occurring at hk is we have to flip the sign of the one to a negative one, and we keep that, well, it's a zero. We keep that sign, if it was a plus, it stays positive. If it's a minus, it stays negative. Because the a value is a negative value, this graph is going to up, open up downward. Its appearance would be something like that. Open up an upside down V shape, right? Um, upside, actually, let me keep that. The upside down V shape means the vertex happens to be a maximum value. It's the highest the graph goes. There is no minimum value of this graph. It does not, it goes down forever, no minimum there. I'm saying these things now because I didn't really probably make mention of these much earlier. So a maximum value of, and it's the vertex y value. So it has a maximum value of zero. That's the largest, that's the highest y value you ever see. You're not writing the coordinate pair, you're not stating the x value unless they ask when it occurs, but the maximum value there is zero. And narrow or wider are same. Because the stretch factor is still one, it hasn't changed its kind of one, uh, down one over one as opposed to up one over one. Um, it didn't stretch or compress at all. It just reflected over it translated, it moved, but it didn't stretch or anything else. It's still the same because compared to the parent function, it's no taller, uh, excuse me, no narrower, no wider because of the one there. Negative flips it over, one being the same as this one here keeps it the same. All right, number two, y equals seven times the absolute value of x minus three and then minus four. Flip, keep, 
All right, that idea, it's, it's, you know, based on the formula, less of the why, more of the how. Flip and keep. Um, because it's a positive A value, this thing will open upward. That means the graph appears in this form right here. Therefore, the vertex being a bottom point means there is no maximum, but there is a minimum. And of course, the minimum occurs at your Y value, your vertex, your Y value of your vertex. So negative four here. Now, I, my graph's a little misleading here, guys. This seven means it goes up seven over one, up seven over one. This thing is tall, guys. This thing is narrow uh, as far as that goes. When A is greater than one, it's a higher rise over that run there. It has a vertical stretch factor of seven. Your graph is vertically stretched, I should say, by a factor of seven. So it's definitely narrower there. The kinds of things I'll be asking my students down the line are, yeah, what is what factor is it stretched or compressed by? Is it a stretch or compression? Those are really the words I like to say. Stretch, stretch versus compression because it's all about vertically what's happening or is there none, stretch, compression, none. I might even say those and then circle which one it is if that's cool. Number three, y equals negative two thirds times the absolute value of x minus one. Now we're not graphing this, but even if we were, no problem. You treat it like a slope, down two over three, that's cool. Uh, one of those plus zero conceits there again. So this is, you know, um, uh, flip keep positive one, po not positive zero, but positive one comma zero is your vertex. Negative right here means it's reflected over the x-axis. We are going to open downward. Opening downward means we have a maximum, maximum value, and that's at the y value of your vertex of zero. Because this value is less than one, not like negative, I mean between one and zero, it's a fraction less than one. Um, down two over three, you run more than you fall. So that means it's wider than it's less wide. <laughs> it's wider than it's taller. It's wider than it's narrower there. Your parent function maybe looks like this, less squiggly, and then this one's wider. So this is vertically compressed by a factor of two thirds. Vertically compressed by a factor of two thirds. All right, number four. Y equals five halves times absolute value of X plus nine minus one. Flip the nine to a negative nine as far as vertex goes there, right? X minus negative nine. Keep the negative one there. That is our vertex location. It is a positive stretch factor, so it opens upward, upward V-shape, minimum. Your vertex is a minimum now. And the Y value of that minimum is negative one. And it's a fraction, but it's not a fraction less than one, right? Five halves is two and a half. That number is more than one. So if the number is more than one, you're rising more than you're running. It is vertically stretched by a factor of, you know, two and a half. It is definitely narrower. It's a taller graph than your parent function of up one over one, right? This is up two and a half over one. So these things, these things go kind of fast. I hope for these last two, I can kind of boop, boop. Y equals um, three quarters. I'm trying to, have to choose a different color. Three quarters times the absolute value of X plus three minus six. Flip, keep, all right. Positive A value opens upward. These things, there's no, this is why we have this rule here, guys. We pull out the A, H, and K, and we should know what these graphs are as a result of pulling out this. It's awesome. Opens upward is always a minimum as far as vertex bottoming out. True for these, true for parabolas. Uh, negative six is the lo lowest y value that we get. Less rise than there is run. That is a vertical compression there. It's less than one, it is wider. And there we are, all done on that one. I'd love to write axis of symmetry, but I'll do that with the graphs when I draw the line. I hope that's okay. And finally, number six. Um, this is one of those, if we go back to our parent function, remember that was x minus zero. That gives me just x, right? x minus zero is x. So when you see this negative x here, I can't really write minus zero inside there, but my h is zero. No translation left or right on this graph here with regard to vertex, but there is a vertical translation up five based on the result of that. I could write a negative one right here to understand that that's my a value, negative one. Because it's negative, we do open downward. Um, because we open downward, we do have a maximum for our vertex occurring at the y value of the vertex, which is five. And being a negative one, again, that's the same as the parent function. This is same z's, no vertical stretch nor compression on this graph there. So those are the first six. I pulled out the information. I am no longer going to pull out the information for these bottom six ones where I graph it. I will just state out loud what they are and let's see if we can play with that. Meanwhile, we could talk about max and min and stuff, but I'm gonna draw the axis of symmetry meanwhile. 
neatly graph each absolute value function. If you're at home doing this, guys, use a ruler uh, after you plot all the points. And my rule is plot as many points as you can fit before you do it. And of course, always arrows, arrows. Uh, at the ends of them. So here we go. My vertex is at three comma zero, three comma zero. Remember flip three, translate three units to the right, zero units up or down. There's the vertex. Positive means we open upward. We rise three, run one. As opposed to the up one over one here, we're going to triple our heights. That's why we call it a vertical stretch factor. Every rise gets tripled. We run one still, but we rise three, rise three, run one, rise three, run one and do the same thing on the other side. Absolute value graphs are V-shaped. They are symmetrical, which I'll get into in a second. Symmetrical. They are symmetrical, and we will get this graph right here. All right. The um, axis of symmetry, I'll kind of draw like this right here. I don't know if you can really see that. Let me, I'll use a different kind of color set. Let me do that again. One moment here, I'm sorry. The uh, That'll, that'll lay on thick here. Let's try this. Okay, not bad. They're kind of little things on the top and bottom. Just ignore them. The axis, I'll, <laughs> I'm going to do a different thing this time. The axis of symmetry is a vertical line that always goes down your vertex as it represents that there's a mirror image of this on both sides, left and right. I think I mentioned that, on, uh, that in the video last time. I don't know if I mentioned the equations. The axis of symmetry, abbreviated AOS. And I'm not going to write AOS each time, but the axis of symmetry here is an x equals equation. All vertical lines are x equals equations. It's wherever x is crossing, uh, 3, x equals 3. You can either see it there or see it from the h value of your vertex. Because it crosses through vertex, what's the x value? That's the name of it. We move forward. I'd love for you to draw those axes of symmetry each time, not so outlandishly pink and weird different dotted things. I'll clean that up next time. All right, number eight. The abs um, negative absolute value of x plus 4, your vertex, your x value, no horizontal translation, no left-right movement, because 0, comma, 4. We are going to start up here for our vertex, right? That's what we pull out. Negative 1, a value, means we open downward, and negative 1 means a regular parent function like slope of down 1 over 1. So down 1 over 1, and yes, I am going to plot as many points as I can fit here. Aww, what? Come on, man. You doing this? Heck yeah. Heck yes, I am. All right, there we go. All right, let's get the color that I so desire. What I have to keep changing here, guys, is all the features, the, the arrows, the thickness, and the uh, color, and the solid line, right? Because when I do this axis of symmetry next, it's going to be a dotted line here. So here we go. Let's do a dotted line. Should I keep it the same color? Let's see how this looks. Oh, dotted line. I forgot. Little, little thinner. Yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, poopy, poopy. There we go. Uh, orange. That's fine. All right. Axis of symmetry. This is x equals zero. The y-axis is your axis of symmetry, and it goes at x equals zero. There you go. By the way, notice I my line tool gives me arrows when I create them. Make sure you're also adding arrows. All right. Number nine. Um, I promised these to be eight second graphs to my students. Let me, let me draw it first and let's see. Okay, ready, set, go. Oh, wait, except all these points. I guess I won't be an eight second graph, but the idea of it's in play. Find your vertex, uber fast, negative three comma five. There we go. I'll do it, I'll try the eight second graph again later when it's not a slope of negative one where I gotta plot every stinking point by my own little rule. That's a different purple, that's all right. Uh, th th this is symmetrical, believe it or not. Just we ran out of window range, right? If I extended this down, there we go. It's symmetrical, right? These go forever. That's what the arrows kind of indicate. So it, it is symmetrical. And of course, that's where we draw our, our axis of symmetry with orange. And that axis of symmetry is x equals negative 3. Okay, that's the AOS. Yeah, some of the information gets a little mundane. You probably saw that at the top. Max or min, it's at the y value. That's you know, all that stuff. It's it's not it's not trying to trick you with stuff. We're trying to get features ahoy ahoy. If they gave you the information, I want you to know what to do with it. All right, let's try the uh, eight second graph again. Vertex negative one, negative one, boom, boom. Slope of positive two, up two over one, 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 up two over one. Remember we bounce off that vertex, you know? <laughs> 
excuse me, without a ruler, I'm sure I could probably do the quick sketch from there, but otherwise, or without a line tool, otherwise I'm going to get that. Voila, eight-ish second graph. <laughs> the axis of symmetry is a whole different story as I get my orange, get my thinness, get my dotted lines, and we go through x equals negative one. That is the axis of symmetry there. All right. All right, fraction slopes, no problem. I actually prefer them because you see how much you get to rise and run from here. I mean, my only problem is choosing a color that I haven't used yet. I haven't used black. Um, so negative two, negative five, flip, keep. Negative two, negative five is my vertex. This opens upward, rise four, run three. Rise four, run three. Bounce out the vertex, rise four, run three. Can't fit anymore. All right. Thank you. Very nice. Pretty nice there. All right. Let's get the. Uh, let me copy and paste this. Check. Check it. Copy and paste. There we go. All right. Probably faster to not copy and paste it. Well, now now it's copied. I can just paste it anytime. This is x equals negative two. Of course, now I'm on the last problem. Uh, I have a backside to this PDF thing. We're going to be writing equations off. Actually, I forget everything we're going to do on the backside, but that's part of it. Maybe a lot less of us graphing, though. All right, um, which is new. We haven't done those kinds of problems yet. All right, number 12. Um, 3, comma 2. Flip the 3, the negative 3, and make it positive. And run two. This thing opens upside down where we will fall 3 and run 2 both directions. So down 3 over 2. Hopefully you're feeling this out, running out of room. Down 3 over 2 down three over two. And you know what I could do, really I should have done this at some point, was should have drawn the axis of symmetry first after I plotted the vertex. And then what you can do instead of saying down three over two here, down three over two, is down three over two, and then reflect two across, over two over two. Kind of like that, kind of gives you a nice little way of plotting other points and using the symmetry to your, uh, well, to your advantage, but to your to a way that you're showing that you know what axis of symmetry actually means, you know? Speaking of which, this is at x equals 3. All right, so there are some of the graphs there. You see the maxes and mins. We haven't really talked about domain and range. We'll see if it comes into play on this stuff on this other side. Let's flip the page. All right. Um, you, we'll talk about range. Here's the thing, guys. For all these graphs, by the way, assume there are arrows going on forever for these. They just, a lot of a lot of picture ones, they don't do it for some reason. Domains on these are all real numbers. They go forever left and right. They go forever one direction up or down, but then they, they bottom or top out at the vertex. So wherever that range is, is based on the vertex and whether we go up forever or down forever as a result of that. But right now, what we're going to do, guys, is come up with the equation based off finding the information, pulling it out, and then writing it based on, once again, it's this f of x equals a times the absolute value of x minus h plus k. All right, so here's what we got. Um, we have a vertex. I'm gonna I'm not going to draw on the graph each time, but I am going to generally label what a, h, and k are so we know how to kind of plug it into the formula a couple times and maybe for some of the last ones, you know, we'll be kind of set after that. Um, I wouldn't mind using some of this for slopes later, but let's start with this. We have a vertex of negative one comma two. That means your H is negative one and your K is two. Your slope, make sure you choose two points that you know for sure it goes through. I, I do believe it goes through right here. So you are seeing a rise and run of one and one. Because it's upward, we know that A is positive. So your one over one is one, it's a positive one. So your equation, here's the raw form of the equation, guys. Here's what it would look like in very, very raw form. It would say f of x or y equals, you know, whatever you want to put, g of x, I don't know, equals 1 times the absolute value of x minus negative 1 and then plus 2. That is the very raw form, the version that you wouldn't see them give you if they asked you to graph it. Here's what they would give you here. And here's where you can decide how you want to write this out. The 1 wouldn't be existing. We wouldn't see it. We would just see absolute value of, and then minus negative becomes a plus. It would become x plus one like that, and then plus two. This is the answer that I'd kind of expect. This is like simplified. This is one that I want you to know what to do with if you're given it. And you know, I don't have to write minus negative each time because I know minus negative is a plus, and I also know that I do flip the h value in the equation itself, and I keep the k value the way that it is. All right, your range here. Um, 
how far down does it go? How far up does it go? You are limited downward. Uh, the lowest value that you hit for Y is two. Every value that you hit for Y above it, like three, four, five, six, everything in between and everything up forever means that your Y values are two and above. So whether you use interval notation or inequalities, you're gonna see me use inequalities almost every single time. I'll show you interval notation this one time. Y is greater than or equal to two or two to positive infinity like that. Either or is kind of acceptable. You'll see me use this one right here. It's a little cleaner, especially when it's not a compound inequality on this one. So there's the range of this guy. Uh, the minimum is at two, you know, things like that. Axis of symmetry at x equals negative one. All right. Keep writing equations here. Now we have a graph that is reflected over the x-axis. It has a translation of left three down two. So your a, h, and k here, your uh, a is negative. We'll talk about the slope in a second. Just know that it's negative by being reflected. Your h is negative three and your k is negative two. Now your slope is, looks like, here's a point it hits, down one over one. So it looks like it's negative one. So a one, but reflected it is negative so if we write a simplified version of this form let's see if we can kind of do this right now and then we kind of drill and kill the last bits in, in a fast fashion uh, f of x equals here negative one you can just write the negative symbol this is not a one this is the absolute value symbol here and then flip the h so x plus three close that and then minus two there's the equation of that guy right there and you can always confirm it by going back and saying is that how i would have graphed it heck yeah the range the maximum is negative two that's the highest y value that we get and we only go down from there so our y values are less than or equal to negative two as such all right there it is so yep uh let's see if we can pull this stuff out once again without writing out the a h and k maybe some point i'll have to again but here we go flipped over graph we know that a is negative looks like we go down two over one so we have an a value of negative two your h is two, so we subtract it. Your k is three, so we add it. Sounds weird, but there's the flip keep. And if you followed along with that, I don't know if you need my help for these other three. You fast forward through that part, please. There's only one more problem beyond these. It's kind of a word problem thing that I'll play with on there. I haven't done these before, by the way. This, these are things, I like to find a sheet that I'm like, yeah, that looks good. That looks good. Or I'll concoct a sheet, randomize it, things like that. And then I'll give it to my students as in, you be the guinea pigs, you let me know what works and what doesn't. The range, y is less than or equal to three. Three is the largest value you get, it goes lower. If you wanna see interval notation with a less than, it would go from negative infinity, sorry, not included, my bad. It would go from negative infinity to positive three, where the three is included, negative infinity is not. That's what that would appear as there. All right, three more. Looks like we're dealing with wider graphs. This is These were vertical stretches right here. This was a vertical stretch. These are vertical compressions. That's a vertical stretch. So you'll see fractions here and that are less than one. So that um, just, just to make sure you know what you're looking for here. How much do we rise? How much do we run there? It's a rise of one and a run of two. So your A value is one half. That is the fraction slope stretch factor, what have you, compression factor, I guess, that brings about this uh, problem. So f of x here is going to be one half times the absolute value of x. Uh, your h value looks like it's negative two, right? Vertex is at negative two comma negative three. So x plus two, flip that, and then minus three there. So mostly the tricky part in that one was the one half, or at least the new bit y is greater than or equal to negative three as it is a minimum it opens upward and we only you know we go up from negative three negative three on y all right right here this is one of those things where um you know you could write more than you actually need to so to kind of you know let this play out um in raw form uh the a oh let's let's take a look at this it's not crossing through there or there it's it's finally hitting here so let's count that the fall in the run opens downward means a is negative down one, two, three, over one, two, three, four. So a, a value of negative three fourths, that's our slope there. So f of x equals negative three fourths times the absolute value of, so your h value is one, we'll do x minus one. And then the k value, we don't translate up or down, so the k value is zero. 
You may write plus zero, but please understand that if it's not written that you know what it means, so I'm gonna do the same thing. Not write it, you know what it means, no vertical translation. And the negative means it's flipped over. We worked on the three-fourths as a result of that too. The range here, y is less than or equal to zero. We include zero as the maximum. It goes down from there, and there's our range. Domains all real numbers, once again. And lastly, oh, I just, hold on. I just messed something up on my, what happened there? That's good, okay, sorry about that. And lastly, uh, number 18, uh, let's back to green. We have a, uh, this is vertically stretched. What's that rise and run? We are rising, it looks like four, rise of four, run of one. So up four over one, our A value is four. F of X equals four times the absolute value of. Um, no horizontal translation. This would be one of those X minus zeros that I'm just going to turn into an X, right? How do we just get absolute value of X in these things? Well, you're subtracting zero. And then minus two, your K value being two, the negative two is minus two. You know, we haven't seen a problem kind of look like that before, a graph, an equation. Uh, the range y is greater than or equal to negative 2. All right, so there's our stuff there. Hope that makes sense. I'll finish off in the word problem here as we've gone 26 minutes. Let's see if I can get this in the next four minutes or so. I haven't seen the problem, so I don't know how long it takes. I've seen it. I, I told my students to avoid it for now just because the scales. Uh, we're dealing more with how we graph out of the form. It, not, not a lot of word problems deal with absolute value, so let's see how their context makes sense of it. The number of boats B a boat dealer sells in each month of the year from March to December can be modeled by the function B equals negative 15 times the absolute value of T minus five plus 120, where T is the time in months and T equals one represents January. So I, so from, uh, huh. <laughs> if this is January, uh, February, March, so that's December, I guess zero is also December, you know, like that. Um, we'll see what they want from March to December later. Basically, I think they're going to limit our domain. When they say T equals one is January, that's just a good tipping point to let you know where to be at. But when they say March to December, guys, that is a domain restriction. That means that we are going to just be going from month three to month 12. Okay, I, I'm gonna let you know that right now. That's This is me seeing this right now for the first time. This is T is between negative three and 12. Now I'll graph what they want. In fact, they give me some of those points to plot. Now I'm going to graph this normally first. Well, this is this is why I told my students not to do it because a slope of negative 15 isn't really good to do on the scale. Um, so I'm going to graph based on their table and then I'll try and plot points where I can fit them. I guess it won't take four minutes. Um, yeah, both sold in months. To just make sense of this, guys, here's basically what's happening. I do know this. I got a vertex at 5 comma 120. 5, 120. I do know that. I, I don't know exactly how the slope will look, but let's say it's something like that, right? When they model this function, their their basic idea is that the that the the dealer, the dealer has a model that understands that around May they sell more boats than any other month, and the boat sales start to decline later and later and later. I don't know why they do in June and July. I, I guess fishing season, whatever, and obviously colder here, so maybe as uh, less, but you know, um, that's that's how the model works out, that, that's how we represent that, in later months, less boats sold, and th this is a model that kind of determines that. Okay, so I do know that, it, listen, we can substitute, we can substitute these numbers into here, and I think that's kind of what they want us to do, so yeah, this will take more than um, four minutes here. Uh, if I substitute five, five minus five is zero, negative 120, right, we know the vertex here is at five comma one. 20. If I substitute 3, I'll do this once with you here, and I'll show you something else that we can do after that. Uh, 3 minus 5 plus 120. This is going to be B of 3. All right, so right here, if you're going to practice this absolute value stuff, that's going to be negative 15 times the absolute value of negative 2 plus 120. The absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. So negative 15 times 2 plus 120 is negative 30 plus 120, which is 90. So this is 90 right there, okay? So we do have do we, uh, we have a point that's three comma 90. 90 is between, halfway between 80 and 100. So it looks like that. Now, um, in order to avoid doing all these calculations here, a couple things. Number one, seven is as far away from five as three is. 
And if you know anything about axis of symmetry, you also know this will be 90 because points the same height are the same distance away. I didn't need to calculate nothing. If you did calculate it, you're doing seven minus five, which is absolute value of two. You still get two. So you're still gonna be getting the same answer from that. All right, that's number one. Number two, kind of think of the slope idea that we're doing. Uh, every time, if your A is negative 15, that means we go, we lose 15 boats a month in sales. Uh, you is, is this rentals? Sells. We sell, oh, that's why you sell more in May because they want to use the summer seasons for it. Anyway, you sell 15 less boats every month. So the idea, we could fill out a whole table, but subtract 15 from 120, you get 105. Subtract that, you get one, uh, 90. Two months later, we sell 30 less boats, right? 15 boats a month is 30 boats in two months. You kind of double it. So what's 30 less boats than 90? That's 60. I'm subtracting 30 there. Um, 30 less, uh, two months later, another 30 less boats is 30 boats. And then month number 12 is 15 less boats, right? One more month, 15 less boats. That's going to be 15. So there's, there's still things you can do with it regarding the slope ish and then kind of plot the points based on that. I know it didn't carry over perfectly there. And I, and I'm excusing my students from kind of needing to do all this mamma jamma, but this is good for content. It's good for them if they want to, you know, play with it. I just wanted to really get them to focus on the other stuff. So nine comma 60. 11 comma 30, that's in between 40 and 20, and then 12 comma 15. Now 15 isn't halfway between zero and 20, but it's halfway between, halfway between <laughs> uh, zero and 20. So here's like 10, 15 is that, so it's, it's a quarter, three quarters of the way up between zero and 20, kind of like that. I think that's our best way to do it. And um, what I'm gonna do here, well, you know, they kind of do it for us. I'm not gonna go all straight arrows through you know, I'm not going to do this, okay? I'm going to go by our domain restriction. What they said was from March to December. So March is month number three, December is month number 12. No arrows. I'm just gonna go ahead and end at that point, end at that point, and we got those approximations to help us with the graph. Now, remember, this is a model. Um, this, this approximates, oh, you know, halfway into the month, we'd sell about this many boats on what is this per day? What is this? I, I guess it's per month. I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and connect that just to give you that domain restriction because obviously we sold in month number four and things like that in April. What is the maximum number of sales in one month? Okay, so this goes back to the whole maximum thing. This is why our answer is the Y value or in this case, the B value. What is the maximum number of sales in one month? 120. That's the Y value. I'm going to, I'm going to call it Y. I know it's B, but that's the Y value. The maximum is a Y. Contextually, that makes sense that it's Y. Now, if they ever ask, so that's the what. The, the when, in what month is a when question. When is the maximum reached is the X. The what is the Y, the when is the X. We sold a maximum of 120 boats in month number five, in the month of May. Month number five, if that kind of helps you. But that's the what, that's the when. That's why our maximum's the y value. Some people believe it's the x. No, 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 that's that's the when there. All right, what is the minimum number of sales in one month? Now, the thing about this that you have to think about is um, this doesn't go down forever. So when I'd ordinarily say there is no minimum, <laughs> there is, you know, we'll sell negative boats. We'll buy boats back. It doesn't really work that way. With regard to the domain that we have, what is the absolute minimum of our domain? That answer is in month number 12, we sold 15 boats. And when we connect the dots, you can tell that that still hits the lowest in month number 12. And on the on month number 12, it hits that. So 15 boats is the minimum number of sales that is reached in December. Those are the only questions they asked. Oh man, I wish they were gonna ask more than that. Anyway, I don't know why, I'm a little picky about it. All right. I thought they could have gotten a lot more clever with some questions like predict how many sales they'd, you know, do in uh, in August, you know, things like that. I wish they'd get a little there, but I understand it. Okay, guys, that'll do it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this, not so much drill and kill it seemed to be because I got to cover more spectrums of things. Um, spectra. Um, so I hope that that was very helpful for you. It's very fun for me. I love doing these things. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you have any more questions. Write them down in the comment section below. Look at the PDF in the description section if you want to try it for yourself. Take care. Thank you so much. Have a good day.